next way in which reductionism fails. And the notion that if you know the starting state, you'll know the complex version and the other way around, all of that. And we've already gotten this. We got this back when in the molecular genetics lectures, which is the role of chance in these systems. All of that stuff we heard about, about sort of molecules vibrating Brownian motion. And what that winds up doing is when cells split, it's going to be unequal distributions of mitochondria. It's going to be things of that sheer chance is going to throw off your ability to deal with a reductive point-for-point -point system. You take identical twins, and they're each at the like fertilized egg stage. And what you know in a reductive world is when it splits in two in this twin and splits a two in this twin, these are going to be, this cell is going to be identical with this one, this one identical with this, all the way down to single molecules because this is a reductive world in terms of how they split. And what we know is by the time a cell splits for the first time, this split is going to distribute the mitochondria between these two differently than distributed between these two, even at the first cell division, chance is throwing off this ability to know the starting state and know what the complex system is going to be. So reductionism breaks down there as well, the fact that chance plays a role in any of these systems. The mitochondria wind up dividing uh, unequally, the transcription factors, you remember all that stuff from there. Same exact thing with transposons, with genes jumping around. You throw in that randomizing chance element into there as well. You can't take the starting states and wind up building on it. An example in behavior, a guy named Ivan Chase, who does really interesting research with dominance behaviors, the emergence of dominance in different species. OK, so you are going to have a colony of like 10 fish. And what you do initially is each one of them is in a tank of their own. And you set up a round robin tournament. You get every possible pairing of fish. You put them against each other. And you see which one is dominant of that pair. So you've done all of that, and you were able to derive a dominance hierarchy, where the number one fish is the one that dominated all the other nine in those dyadic interactions. Number two dominated eight of them, so on. It is simply a process, a syllogistic expansion, to be able to then generate a dominance hierarchy. Pure, I know the starting state, every single dyad, and what the outcome was. I can now predict what the dominance hierarchy is going to be when you put all the fish together. And what he sees, of course, is once you actually get the fish together in a social group, there is no resemblance whatsoever. The dyadic pairing dominance outcomes has zero predictability over what the actual dominance hierarchy is going to be like. Why should that be? Because chance plays a role as well. You are a fish, and you've learned this transitivity stuff, as fish are able to do, at least in Professor Fernald's lab. And they're able to do, if he defeats him and he defeats me, I better give that guy a subordinating gesture. We've now just fit together two of those pieces, establishing the dyad beforehand. But what if the guy happens to be facing the other way and doesn't see him dominating him? And you've just lost the chance. Chance interactions wind up driving the system. Random movement of the animals and such winds up meaning knowing the starting states of the dominance relations of every single dyad gives you zero predictability of what the complex system is going to look like. So what we have over and over here is amid this wonderful westernized focus on reductionism. And this is going to tell us exactly how complex systems work and know the starting state and know the full one. We're seeing here over and over in biological systems ranging from behavior of entire organisms down to genes, reductive systems break down because there's simply not enough pieces in there to explain complex function in a point-for-point -point reductive component part broken down, add them up together afterward way. And there's no way to deal with the fact that chance plays a role in biological systems. 
So what have we just gotten to here, 500 years or so into this reductive program, what we're seeing is if you kind of are interested in behavior or the brain or any of that stuff, what you've just discovered is the most interesting domains of brain function, of genetic regulation, the most interesting stuff can't be regulated in a classical reductive way. It breaks down there. It can't be that way. It's got to be something else. So what this will do now is transition us into this whole issue of chaotic systems. What happens when you have a system that is not reductive, where there is non-linear, non-additivity, where you suddenly have a very different picture? If a clock is broken, you take the pieces apart and you find the one tooth and one gear there that's missing and you fix that and you now are able to put the pieces back together in an additive way and you will have fixed the clock. A clock can be fixed using reductive point-for-point -point knowledge. Now you have a problem with something else. You have a cloud that doesn't rain enough during a drought. How are you going to figure out what's wrong? I know, let's divide the cloud in half and then get better tools so we can divide each half into half and each half into half and eventually we'll get like one molecule verse worth of cloud and a gazillion of them where we understand how each one of them works and put it together and then we'll understand why there's a drought. It doesn't work that way. Reductive approaches can be used to fix clocks. Reductive approaches can't be used to understand why clouds don't rain. And the whole point of all chaos in these lectures here is when you look at the interesting complex biological systems, they're clouds. They're not clocks. You need a whole different explanatory system.